Before I get started, I had somebody ask me today what my shirt meant. Does anyone know what this shirt means? Amateur radio. No. 73? Yes. Are we low book? Yes. Um, oh, what, a well, fantastic that, hey, wait, wait. No. What was the question? <laughs> Does anyone know what this shirt means? I had somebody ask me about Herbie it. Was oh, that's an amateur radio number. Is it no. Is no. It Herbie no. was 50. Did any, didn't anybody watch Big Bang Theory? I mean, it was really made for people like us. Yes. I do. Okay. I like Penny. This is Sheldon's favorite number because 73 is objectively and demonstrably the best number. And I've got some people in this room, like Namir and probably Gene, who will understand why it's the best number. But for the rest of you, I will explain. It's a prime. 73 is the 21st prime. Its inverse, 37, is the 12th prime. Mm. This makes 73 what we call a mirror number. A mirror number is a prime who... When it's reversed, it's also a prime, and the index of the two primes are also mirrors. So 73 is the 21st prime, 37 is the 12th prime. And the fun part is, 73 being the 21st prime, what do you get when you multiply 73? 21. 73 is also a palindrome in binary, 1001001. It is a mirrored prime, it is a product prime, and it's a binary palindrome. If you can find another number that is all these, let me know. But I don't think there is one. Uh, in 73 in amateur radio means uh, goodbye. It's a salutation. Nobody 73s. Cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> I can assure you that was standard <laughs> decades before yes. Big Bang. Uh, in other news, uh, those of you that took the self-driving ride demo recall that it was one of the things I pointed out and that you probably experienced personally was the car in some cases will make very jerky turns, uh, even in completely unobstructed streets where there are no other vehicles or clear line of view, and it's just not obvious why it's doing that. The new update to the software has started rolling out as of late yesterday evening, and the occupancy networks I mentioned are included, and they do seem to make things a lot nicer. Now, I thought about pulling my car up to the front of the hotel and trying to get on Wi-Fi, but, uh, well, it might work, uh, but some people, like the people I might be driving back to Reno with, have suggested that maybe it's not a good idea to try to update the car's software in the middle of a 2,200-mile road trip, so I don't get to do that. Anyway, uh, this is a presentation on the Texas Instruments SR60 calculator, and it's a slightly updated version of a presentation I gave in 2011, well before many of you were born. So some of you probably have not seen it. This is the updated version. And I have two functional versions of this calculator. Now, one of the reasons we love HPs is the quality of construction. And this is especially driven home if you've ever dealt with Texas Instrument products, which, by way of comparison, are hastily slung together engineered to shave fractions of a penny wherever they could. And the reason you don't see a lot of SR60s around is none of them work anymore. <laughs> and they also came out at a weird time and were aimed at a strange audience, but we'll get into that. Uh, this one in the back has been completely rebuilt. I mean, the guy, Larry Atherton, who primarily works in HPs, desoldered every socket in the board, replaced them with machine sockets, replaced the weird laminated flex cables that you normally see in things like printer heads where things move, but TI use them to connect parts that don't move relative to each other and they just fall apart. They've been replaced with stranded wire cables and rebuilt the power supply, blah, blah, blah. Even so, the card reader has gotten very pissy after this trip in a giant foam <laughs> case. So, you know, there's only so much you can do. This is the only desktop programmable calculator Texas Instruments ever built. Oh, are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. I have a story about that. Richard has a story about that, which we'll get to right after this talk. All righty. The SR60 was introduced in 1976, and a version with expanded memory was introduced in 1977. In 2022 dollars, about almost $5,000. So it was a big, big hit. Uh, the expanded version, like that one back there, has 3,120 bytes of memory which by coincidence is almost exactly eight times the 3,072 bits of memory my 9100s have. So there's that. 
It uses the TMCO501 4-bit processor that's very common in that H, or TI rather, <laughs> used a lot of handhelds like the 58 and 59. And it is super frustrating that it is apparently Satan has come and gobbled up all the information in that processor. There is almost nothing you can find out about it. Instruction set, cycle times, it registers, just nothing. So the nice thing about this calculator was it has a 20 character full alphanumeric display, similar to the one, say, the TI-88 has, except it's a giant red LED instead of a liquid crystal display. It's for scientists and engineers, assistants and technicians, financiers, businessmen, and secretaries. This is right from their brochure, and that is the intended market. HP products tended to go to actual scientists and engineers, and while this could certainly do scientific and engineering stuff, that was the market. This uh, also illustrates a cassette tape drive and a modified IBM Selectric typewriter, although I can tell if these were, I can tell you if these were connected, there would be a cable coming out right there. So, A, that's not connected, and B, neither of these peripherals have ever been observed outside this brochure. There's no evidence that they were ever made. Uh, if somebody knows different, let me know. Damn, she's cute. She, did, she never really existed either. I don't know. I kind of hope she did. Of course, she'd be our age by now, so who cares? <laughs> Here's the timeline to kind of put this in perspective. We had the 9100A and B in the late 60s. And then in the 70s, early 70s, we got the 9810, the 9820, and 30, and the HP 35. Now, these were all very significant machines. HP 45 and 73, 65 and 74, 9815, which used a uh, Motorola 6800 processor, 25, and then the 9825 and the SR60 in 1976. Now, the reason this timeline is significant is that the SR60 is missing some features we had all the way back here especially in terms of math, which is a little disturbing, but anyhow, uh, we've got our keyboard in several divisions. On the left keyboard, we have memory access functions, scientific functions, you'll still see we have cosine, tangent, sine, blah, blah, blah. We have some interesting keys up here, degrees mode with an LED, a trace mode with an LED, and limited precision with an LED. Why would you want to limit the precision of your calculations? Anybody want to take a guess? Speed. Who said speed? Ding, ding, ding. You get a win. Although it doesn't work, but we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, the switch X and K key makes the display number a constant, but if you press second switch X and K, that's how you partition the memory between program steps and data registers. Now this is also very similar to the TI-88. This was what TI called a programmable prompting calculator. And when you turn the TI-88 on, it says, may I help you? When you turn this thing on, it says prompting required. And if you say yes, it fires up the card reader and you're supposed to insert the card. And unlike the HP calculators, once the program is read in, it starts executing automatically. It just runs. And the reason is that nice red-haired woman we saw that in the early 70s, has never seen a computer, doesn't know what it is, and we need to make things as simple as possible for her. Uh, we also have a numeric keyboard, parentheses keys. Oddly enough, Y to the X and X3 to Y keys. I guess they run out of places to put them. And we can handle up to 10 levels of parentheses. This is purely algebraic. The right keyboard is where it gets fun. We have the read and write keys for the card reader. We have conditionals. If error, if positive, if zero, which I will rant about in the near future. And then we have these keys, which I really love, step forward, step backwards, insert and delete. So editing programs in this thing is really nice because A, you have a big alphanumeric display. Instead of key codes, you see key mnemonics, which is great. And I know all of us have memorized the key codes in our 65s and 67s. But once we got the 41s and started seeing key mnemonics, <laughs> Especially once you get a large library of functions, that's just so much nicer. Now, there's another key here called QUE, which we'll also get to. But first, the hardware. Now, I took a bunch of this out because uh, Gene said nobody cares, but there's still a little bit left. Uh, the bottom is this huge aluminum casting. The top is plastic. If you take the top off, you see this. 
From the rear, you see this big open power supply, which looks a little crude today. You always replace that capacitor, by the way. Printer, display. And here's a DB25 port, which is how you would connect the non-existent typewriter and tape drive. <laughs> if you flip the keyboard over, this is basically the circuitry. And you'll notice uh, a popular 70s technique of double stacking your chips. Those are memory chips. Uh, really? Yes, really. See, there's and stacked not, chips there. They're soldered though, right? They're soldered together, yeah. yes. But this is a picture before all the sockets were replaced. And this is a problem with the machine because this board, you can see the keyboard there. So when this board is in the calculator, things are hanging in the sockets upside down. And this isn't really that much of a problem if it's just sitting in your desk. But if you like throw it in the back of the car and truck across the country, yeah, it's a problem. But lest anyone think that that piggyback RAM technique mm -hmm. is something, something crude that, that a better manufacturer might not use, the HP41CX originally, the, the early boards for that, used that same technique. Damn you for shattering my illusions. <laughs> uh, these are the sockets we're all familiar with, and these are the sockets the machine back there has now. Much nicer. Uh, these are the laminated flex cables, which were unkeyed, so when I was originally taking it apart, I'd use a Sharpie to mark the edge of the cable so I didn't plug it in backwards. And of course, these cables over time tend to start peeling apart, and then moisture gets in there, and they're just, I can see why I'd use a flex cable to connect something like a print head that moves, but TI use them everywhere, probably because they're, I don't know, maybe they're really cheap. Are they cheap? Okay, they're cheap. Oh, no. Yes? It might be because they, they wanted to keep them short enough if you used a bundle cable, say, mm -hmm. and then you'd route it around, uh, there, there may be some arguable technical reasons to have done that, yeah. No, they're not. <laughs> so you can move them in loud. Yeah. So my cables all now look like this, new connectors, and they're stranded. So hopefully they'll last a bit longer. Okay. Uh, interestingly enough, the cards used by the SR60 are dimensionally identical to the cards used by the 9820. The only difference is on the 9820, we had these little punch out sections that were scored in the card. You pop them off with your fingernail to right protect the card. And the TI cards are right protected by default and you had little black plastic labels where you could scribble in with a Sharpie and these squares to right enable them. But the cards are to the fraction of a millimeter, same width, same height, which is... Oh, same. Yes. Probably the same manufacturer. I would guess they are, but yeah, because, yeah, you know. I don't know. Programming. Uh, the base machine has 1,919 programs, well, 1,920 program steps and 100 memories. The expanded machine in the back is 5760 program steps and 430 memories. You can move a slider up or yes. If you can use that. Can I use it? Uh, you can adjust memory between program steps and registers, as was common at the time. And you see the mnemonics on the display. There are no merged keystrokes, unlike the more advanced HP calculators. So if you needed to store something in memory register 5, you'd have to say store 005, and that would take four steps. However, if the next step after the five were non-numeric, you could omit the meeting zero. So if you, you could say store five sign, and that would work just fine. Program editing is easy with step, back step, insert, delete. The trouble is, and I verified this, if you have the base SR60, these commands are all fairly quick. Step and back step, they're quick and anyway, but insert and delete happen fairly quickly. Once you have an expanded machine with five or six times the memory, insert and delete get very, very slow. And it's pretty obvious that they're not trying to determine the end of the program or everything. If you're at step 10 and you say insert, it's going to try to move thousands of instructions, even the ones that are blank, up. And if you delete, it's going to try to move thousands of instructions down. And on my machine back there, uh, insert and delete can take anywhere from three to seven seconds per keystroke. So that's a little tedious. Boom. Yeah. There are only three conditional branches, if error, if positive, and if zero, and you can invert them by preceding with the second key, so if no error, if negative, and if not zero. The trouble is, unlike the TI-59, which preceded this, 
There is no dedicated test register. So all you've got is a display, and if you want to see something is equal to five, you will call it to the display, subtract five from it, and then test the result, which is, I don't like destructive tests, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, the special sequence, second key go to, is your single loop counter. It decrements the number of registers zero and branches of the following label if it's not zero. So if you have nested loops, you have to implement the other counter yourself, and then you have to use these destructive tests. You have to recall a number from, if you want to see if a loop is executed ten times, you can put a number to register, subtract, subtract, and keep recalling and checking for zero. So. Unlike the HPs where we could do increment or decrement and point to a register even via indirection, which is much nicer. We have 10 levels of flags and 12 levels of subroutines, which is nice. And the indirect key can be used with memory registers as well as go to and subroutine, which you will never want to do, but I'll explain that in a moment. So you can have uh, indirect store recall, sum product, and exchange, and then you can flip sum and product with the second key to make a subtract and divide. Indirect can be used with go to and subroutine if you know a line number, but when you're dealing with the program thousands of lines long, and it does not automatically update line numbers, obviously, you probably don't want to do that, especially because, well, it's probably somewhere else, but I'll explain why. One clever feature the TI has is when you read a card or you enter a program and take it out of learn mode, it's going to sit there flickering the display for a period of a time. And one of the things it's doing is it's building a jump table. So with the old HP calculators, they would start searching for labels at zero. And so we were taught tricks like try to keep your labels near the start of a program because no matter how many times you branch to label blah, if label blah is on step 300, it's going to search for all 299 steps. The TISR60 builds a jump table, and so go to label blah is comparatively fast. And so there's no real advantage to using absolute line numbers over labels in most cases. Is that like compiling the go-to's on the 41 kind of? It's like that, except it does it, it does it all at once when you leave program mode, whereas the yeah. 41 yeah. compiled them as an encounter. As you run it, yeah. 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 Now, here's the fun part. It is a, as the brochure said, a programmable prompting calculator. And the big shtick here is that people that don't have to be calculator computer people, remember this was the mid to late 70s, so except for people like us, nobody was. And this calculator would, you could write programs that would lead the uninitiated by the hand. And it was used through this question key. The question key pauses the running program, displays the contents of the alpha register, and then you have yes, whoop, I'm sorry, yes, no, does not apply, is not known, and enter. And the syntax is, do we want to fire missiles? So, here's the program. We switch to alpha mode, fire missiles, switch out of alpha mode, and then hit question. If the user presses yes, we jump to label E2. If the user presses no, E3. If the user presses not apply or not known, we jump to those labels. And if the user presses enter, it just falls through. It doesn't go to a label. It just continues executing code at that point. So with a little work, you could write programs that were very simple for people to use. But of course, we know users. Let's try a small program. Let's see how fast this thing is. We'll generate the cubes of the integers one through nine and store each in a separate memory register. The cube of nine will be stored in register nine, the cube of five will be stored in register five. So here's the program. We use our uh, indirect store here. We do our loop counter. And, you know, this is pretty simple. It's a loop. It does nine multiplies. Although you'll notice that, uh, well, Instead of cubing a number, I'm recalling it times recalling it times recalling it. I said, so, Dave, why don't you just raise it to the third power? And the answer is that on an SR60, raising an integer to an integer power does not give an integer result. Because... You're using log. Yes. Log and then well, everybody, I'm, I'm sure HP is using logs at some point, but somehow they finesse the results. Anyhow. 
there's a specific HP Journal article for people interested in that that's, that's called the New Accuracy, Making Two to the Third Equal Eight. <laughs> yeah. And admittedly, the, uh, the imprecision is in the tens or hundreds of thousands, but still, it ain't an integer. So this program runs in about seven seconds on an SR60. Uh, and here we get into that thing about the integers. And somebody else suggested, why don't you just use int? Well, because int rounds. So if you say three cubed and take the integer of that, you get 26, not 27. So that's not a, that's not a solution. Let's run the same program in a 9815, which was a contemporaneous machine. 1.5 seconds. That's a lot faster. Of course, the 9815 used a 6800 processor, which was vastly more powerful than the little 4-bit thing that SR60 uses. Also, the 9815 only has a gas plasma numeric display. In fact, my 9815 is the HP I hate the most because not only does it not have alpha in the display, you can't even see program listings in the display. There are no key codes, no steps. When you list a program, it's on the printer. If you want to edit a program, it's on the printer. It has the loudest thermal printer ever made. It literally sounds like a machine gun. So it's a fast machine. It's got a very nice programming language. You could probably do a whole thing in it, but we're not going to. Here's the program on the 9810. HP's second programmable calculator after the 9800. This is really, really old. And so far, it's the fastest yet. It takes about half a second. Cool. Here's another test, the test that Gene mentioned, where we just sit in the loop adding one, adding one, adding one. After a minute, the SR60 has gotten up to 344. The 9810 has gotten to 12,453, and the 9815 has gotten to 25,900. And at this point, you might be asking yourself, why would somebody buy a machine this slow? Good question. She's why. Man. Yeah. yeah. The 9815 and 9810 are technical machines. They have no display alphanumerics. They cost a lot more than the SR60, and they were harder to use. And so it would be difficult. You could set one of those machines in front of our assistant secretary, whoever she is here, or any person that wasn't familiar with the stuff, which in the late 70s was pretty much everybody except us. And you'd have to give them days of training to use it, where with an SR60, you can pretty much show them how to read a card and you know, press the buttons, and you're Bob's your uncle. And there weren't that many alternatives. The, the equivalent HP things were very expensive. Uh, computers like the Apple II were somewhat available, but there really wasn't any elaborate software for them. And so the alternative to an SR60 was a pencil and a piece of paper, basically. So, you know, we can make fun of the performance, and I do regularly, but it's still a good solution considering the alternatives that were available at the time. So, let's get into five things I hate about the SR60. It is really slow. I'm unaware of any programmable calculator ever made that's slower. Now, since I put that little asterisk there, because Gene has pointed out that there were, in fact, the HP 65 is slower in some respects. So this might not be a completely accurate statement, but boy, it's slow. But it was quieter. Yeah. The 65. The 65 card reader is also much quieter. The 60 card reader is kind of loud. Even the features designed to make it faster, building jump tables. If you enter, if you when you read in a long program off the card, and it sits there building the jump tables, you can be staring at that flickering display for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds. And like machines at the time, it doesn't have a little light to indicate it's busy, it's just the display is flickering. In fact, I showed it to somebody recently, um, today, well, not today, yesterday at the conference, and they said, oh, something's broken. I said, why do you say that? Look at the display. No, no, that's, that's normal. What about for calculating, say, a, a trig function? Was it fast enough? I haven't. It was fast enough. I mean, you press the button, there it goes. But yeah, I haven't done yeah, it in well, a loop. The to 25, really... they had mm. allowed one second because, mm. you know. Yeah. The SR52 of the time using the same processor is faster. Now this is odd because 
When you have the same processor in a battery powered device and an AC powered device, typically you run it at quite a bit higher clock speed than the AC powered device, so I don't know. And everybody that does know is dead. There's only one loop counter with that second go to instruction that decrements and branches on zero with register zero. You can implement your own loop counters, but come on, TI. Yeah, I mean, 5,800 program steps. One, one loop counter. Somebody was sleeping. There's no T register, so the only way to test something is to recall it to the display, perform some math operation, do the test of the result. It takes a lot of steps, it's slow and it's destructive, so I don't like it. And the alpha implementation, while nice, is a bit clumsy. When you're programming the alpha strings, you would expect to see them on the display, but you don't. When you press a key, like the question key is also the key for the letter T. So when you're in alpha mode, you press the Q key, that puts a T in the program, but on the display of the calculator, you see QUE. If you list the program on the printer, you see T. And this is probably because when it's listing, it's sequentially running through the program. It can see that you've hit an alpha instruction and then no, but if you're just idly scrolling through it on the calculator. It doesn't know at any particular time if an alpha instruction existed back here, so it's a little clunky. Here's the example of that. So this program actually has an alpha instruction at instruction 2, and so you would expect instruction 3 to show a T, but instead on the display it shows QUE. Oh, David? Yes? Uh, can you go back that? So there's essentially a numeric part of it, and then the alpha numeric part? The numeric part is the step number. That's step three in the program. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's not necessarily a normal no. number format. Okay. Question. No. Oh. And the last thing is the imprecise math. I mean, a lot of TIs did this at the time. I'm, I don't know when they quit doing it. The 52 does it, the 59 does it. Uh, I just find it staggering that you can cube three, take the integer, and get 26. And that somebody at TI said, eh, good enough. What is it if you don't take 26.9? It's, well, I'd have to go do it. Well, the machine's right back there. We can give it a shot. So if you rounded it. Yeah. It's odd that it rounds down, but there you go. Three years prior, HP, now HP to, to, you know, HP did that with the 35, but their second calculator, the 45, fixed it. And that was three years before the SR60 came out. And it's not built for the long term. So if you open our HP machines, gold is everywhere. Chips are soldered rather than socketed, which has pluses and minuses, but for reliability, it's good. Those upside down sockets, are they only mm -hmm. on one side of the board? It's a single sided board. Why don't you drive home with it upside down? <laughs> That's an idea. That's a, of course, that puts the heavy aluminum base plate in the top. Oh, couldn't be any worse. Uh, the use of the delicate mylar flex cables for things that don't move. Read the service manual. I, the service manual doesn't exist. I have an electronic copy of it. I don't know where I got it. I wish I had read it because when I was working on my second one, at one point I had unplugged the mylar flex cable connecting the printer, not the print head, the printer, to the main circuit board. And I turned it on and I said, I smell something. And then a string of black cat firecrackers went off. Pop, 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 pop. Those were the individual thermistors in the print head. Those prints heads are not easy to obtain. Uh, if you read the service manual, it says, oh, by the way, you never power the printer up with the data cable disconnected. You know, is this one of those things where a couple of diodes could have prevented this from happening? Probably. Never know. But it's not all bad. Here's five things I love. It's got a big, bright red dot matrix LCD. It's easy to read in any indoor lighting. And it displays alpha. I mean, really, nobody else was doing that at the time. Actual individual key switches. Now, a lot of the HP machines I like, like, say, the 9815, early 9825s, use basically calculator keyboards. You had those metal snap domes. And admittedly, HP had very, very good metal snap domes, but eventually those snap domes will fail. And 
You know, you, you either have a spare of that calculator around to steal a keyboard from, or you don't. These are individual switches. Now, I don't, have not disassembled them. I don't know if they're maxi switch or whatever, but I have yet to see a key switch in an old machine that I couldn't desolder, take apart, clean, reassemble, and fix, because I've done it a lot. Also, I'm not sure if the keys are double shot, but I've never seen key legends worn off. I don't know, SR60, they look fine. Give it to Joe Horn for a week. Nah, no. <laughs> Joe doesn't come to these things, he doesn't get any calculators. It has program editing. We have insert and delete. I mean, we didn't get that in HPs, I guess, till the 41. No, no uh, 67. The 67 was automatic, but delete. The, the 65 was kludgy in program editing. 67, you could delete a command. Okay. And auto insert with delete. Okay. But on this machine, insert and delete, can, I say five to seven seconds, it can actually take longer depending on the amount of memory in the machine. A lot, if you've got the owner's manual and there's one in the entire world, he, Eric Recklin has it, uh, it has a whole section on really clever little programming tricks. And I won't go into, but it's interesting, somebody sat down and figured out a way to optimize certain aspects of the calculator that are things you would never think of on your own, and they've got a whole section on it in the manual. Here's how to optimize for space. Here's how to optimize for speed. They even did really weird little things, like when you're putting in alphanumeric strings, if you hit a function key that's not in the alpha keyboard, like the int key, the integer key is not in the alpha keyboard, it's over here, but if you're in alpha mode and you hit int, that is a one-step solution for entering INT. For example, a program that does interest calculations. You'll have int arrest in the program, which I think is kind of clue. And honestly, it just looks cool. The SR60 looks like a prop from a science fiction movie at the time, and most of the HP machines at the time looked like something that would be in a lab or an industrial setting. So H I think TL really wanted the aesthetics. Pros and cons, cheaper than equivalent HP products, better program editing, full alphanumeric display, really easy to set up for non-technical users, and the card reader is huge and is physically very easy to work on compared to, say, taking apart the one in your 65, 67, 41, 97. The cons, it is really, really slow. It is delicate like a butterfly. It is constructed entirely of custom TI PMOS chips. If I jump a spark here, there's a pretty good probability that it'll take out a chip in the machine back there if it's not plugged in. The conditionals are clumsy, but the biggest gotcha is if I have a question about an HP calculator, I got a lot of people I can ask. I got a question about that thing, I'm on my own. The only person I know that's not me that has one is Jordan Warner. And he is a collector, but he is not a technical collector. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he, he's, he's doing a great job maintaining his collection, but it's, you know, he, I can't ask him detailed technical questions about the calculator, like, should I power it up with the printer data cable disconnected? Will that be bad? He, he would probably know because I told him. <laughs> By the way, York, don't do this. <laughs> Credits. Datamath.org and York Warner are still the best solution, best single place for information on most TI machines. OldCalculatorMuseum.com, uh, Rick does have one and he's dug into it a little bit. And RSQ.org, I think RSQ.org is still there. Yes. A lot, yeah. yes. Okay, a lot of stuff. I think there were, originally in 2011 I had one other thing, but it's gone, so I took it off. And that is all. Any questions? Yes? I, I, I was out at the very beginning. What did this cost? Uh, in 2022 dollars, about $4,800. When it was new. When it was new. Well, for that, we'll have to go back. <laughs> 55 slides or so. Oh, that's not our touch screen, is it? 49. Bang. Here we go. Uh, $1,700 for the SR60. $1,000 for the next SR68, but that was introduced a year later. And these were discontinued in 1979. <coughs> Anecdotal evidence is that they did not sell very well. Uh, probably because TI had a little trouble 
you know, precisely identifying a, a market and pushing it. Only that lady got it. Only that, only the redhead got in, it, yes. In the mid-1980s, in fact, in the calculator ad section folder, there's an ad for an SR60 programmer. I found that somebody was needing somebody to program one in the mid-80s. Now, granted, no time machine doesn't help us, but somebody was using it in the mid-80s. I found that funny. That is kind of cool. And it's pretty easy to program. I mean, what was the difference? The A is so much. The A had more memory, a lot more memory. Oh, but they're just two little slots in the bottom. You can add, you can make an, a regular SR60 and A if you can find these unobtainable memory boards. Unobtainable? Where did you get yours? Was it like an eBay thing or from Blackie? Oh, God, I wish you could ask me that. Yes, it was eBay. It was a lot, it was pre 2011, because 2011 is when I gave this first talk. And the second one, I can't recall, but, uh, oh no, the second, the one back there is the second one, my original. Uh, when I had contracted Larry Atherton to rebuild my 9800s, he said, oh, by the way, I've got this SR60, would you be interested in it? And I said, yeah, and that was like eight years ago. And about three months ago, he finished it. <laughs> because he, had, he runs a company that does engine simulation software, and that's where he makes his real money, the calculator stuff's a hobby. So that one came from Larry Atherton. The other one that doesn't work as well is one I found on eBay and have worked on myself to some extent. Anything else? Then that's all. Thank you, David.